and good morning to fellow advocates of entrepreneurship and partners in development in the Philippines and in Asia. I'm very honored to be with you here today and very happy to talk about something very close to my heart, which is entrepreneurship and the development of small enterprises and startups in the country. It's a healthy break from talking about our very interesting political atmosphere. Of course, we just had the uh, SONA plus plus the other day. Uh, SONA among other things. Uh, so this is actually quite refreshing for myself, for our staff, to go back to something that we truly love, and that's talking about entrepreneurship and the things that we need to do to further push it here in our country. Um, Richard, of course, was very kind in his introduction. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, sometimes I think a little too kind, no? but, <laughs> but uh, we'll take it, no? Uh, Richard was talking about um, my weight loss of 10 pounds. It's not really staying up at night. The best diet is just stress. So I think you just lose all the weight once you're stressed out. Uh, so today let me start with talking about what we want to see in our country. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, we have to talk about the promise of inclusive growth. When I first became a senator, it was this dream of a prosperous Philippines. Not just for a chosen few, but for everyone. It was this dream that moved us to pass reforms for entrepreneurship. As a former entrepreneur working in the microfinance sector and with micro-business owners, I saw the power of business to transform lives and uplift Filipinos from poverty to prosperity. Entrepreneurship is key to distributing wealth, beefing up our middle class, and ultimately in defeating poverty. And so it became our mission when we became a senator in 2013 to create that ecosystem that would support our countrymen, to help them transform into capable, successful entrepreneurs that can provide for their families. These reforms we put in a framework, and uh, that framework we call the three M's, money, mentorship, and market. Three M's that every entrepreneur needs, whether you're micro, small, medium, or large. And I'm happy to share that this is also the current framework that the DTI actually uses in their programs for entrepreneurship. First, first M, money. Money means access to financing and capital. Uh, as we all know, this is one of the most crucial pillars in putting up a business, but we add to that training in financial literacy and even accounting. So these are the basics no, that every business needs. Whether you're a Sari Sari store or the largest retailer, you need that access to financing that matches your size in the market. The second M is mentorship. And this includes training entrepreneurship as well as having someone to go to and guide you uh, when you need help in running your business. The truth is we found that studies have shown that mentorship is one of the most important factors in the success of any business. If you have groups of people or individuals or institutions that are helping you grow along the way, you will, be, you will have a better chance of actually succeeding. The third M is of course market. And for me, this is the one that many of our MSMEs terribly, terribly need help in. And this means having your products and services get to formal markets, get to the areas where there is purchasing power, to be able to get your products and services to more areas in our country, and of course, even outside the country. These three M's, put them together, money, mentorship, and market, serves as our guide and our formula in passing reforms for entrepreneurship. Now, in the 16th Congress in 2013, I was very lucky to be given the chairmanship of trade. And uh, that used to be the Committee on Trade and Commerce, and as when we got in, we added one more, and it became the Committee on Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. And in the 16th Congress, my first three years in the Senate, we passed a number of laws that created this healthy ecosystem that opens doors and opportunities for Filipino entrepreneurs. So Richard mentioned this, and these, the first law that we passed is RA 1096-10644, and this is the Go Negosho Act, which establishes negotiation centers in every town, city, municipality, and province of the Philippines to serve as a network of support hubs for entrepreneurs, linking them to suppliers and markets, linking them to financial opportunities, linking them to people who can mentor them. Currently, we have more than 800 negotiation centers already in the past four years, and we will soon be closing in on our 900th negotiation center. I'm happy to share that the Department of Trade and Industry continues to make this one of their flagship programs. 
These negosyo centers, by the way, Richard, have serviced more than a million MSMEs already today. And all of our MSMEs, whether they're sari-sari stores, they're small business owners, they're food entrepreneurs, they can go to these negosyo centers, get support in registering their business, join a program that's free in terms of mentorship, and even be linked to a financial, uh, uh, to, to capital opportunities, whether from the private or public sectors. Another law that we're very proud of is RA 10693, or the Microfinance NGO Act, that supports our microfinance NGOs and provides a variety of non-collateralized loans to low-income households, as well as financial literacy and entrepreneurship training. This is one of those laws that we were able to pass, um, even though we did have some issues with BIR when we were trying to pass this law, we were eventually able to get this passed. And now our microfinance NGOs, now take note, these are the non-profit microfinance organizations, now have a framework for them to grow and be able to provide more support for our countrymen. Another law that we passed, and this is the one that um, we did in partnership with the Central Bank, is RA 10744, or the Credit Surety Fund Cooperative Act. The Credit Surety Fund Cooperative Act also provides um, access to credit uh, through cooperatives and microfinance institutions. We actually institutionalized one of the best programs of the Central Bank when it came to inclusive finance. And so far, we have around 50 uh, credit surety funds all over the Philippines providing non-collateralized access to capital through our cooperatives for MSMEs. Another law that um, we were quite happy with because this was also a landmark law, uh, this was about 2015, is RA 10668 or the amendments to the cabotage policy. People still ask me, uh, sir, cap cabotage, cabbage ba yan, no? Uh, hindi ko yan tungkol sa mga cabbages. Cabotage, of course, is refers to the shipping in our country. And the cabotage policy or RA 10668 is there to lower the cost of shipping in the Philippines, uh, which traditionally has been very high here in our archipelago. RA 10667 might be uh, something relevant to many of you here, especially if you come from big businesses, and that's the Philippine Competition Act. We passed this also in 2015, and RA 10667, or Philippine Competition Act, the first antitrust legislation in the Philippines. After 25 years in the legislative mill, we were able to pass this finally. And this sets the ground rules to create a fair business environment, and of course to penalize any abuses in dominant position in anti-competitive behaviors, hopefully to level the playing field for our MSMEs. The Philippine Competition Act, of course, had in mind that the SMEs, our small businesses, our disruptive businesses, should be given that free reign in the market to compete and to be able to bring prices down uh, and compete with these large companies. We also passed RA 10679 or the Youth Entrepreneurship Act, uh, and this institutionalizes financial literacy and entrepreneurship training in our schools. Unfortunately, this has not yet been implemented by the Department of Education, but the goals of 10679 is quite, uh, quite lofty, and that is to include basic financial literacy at all levels of our education system. You know, in other countries, uh, and we, we got this from a Citibank uh, survey done in 2015, other countries actually start their financial literacy at grade two or grade three. It's a very simple program. They ask the kids to save uh, a few pesos or a few, uh, a little bit of um, uh, money every day. And at the end of the semester, the teachers allow the students to go use that money and buy something they like. And they found that that very simple exercise on financial literacy created, you know, helped create a foundation for a uh, better understanding of how to use money for the future. Our country, in that same survey, ranked one of the lowest in terms of financial literacy. And I still contend that if we do want to support our MSMEs, we do want to be able to create this environment of inclusive business in the Philippines. We need to start with financial literacy in our schools. This Congress, I was no longer the chairman of uh, trade. It was Senator Zubiri at the start of the, set of the 17th Congress, and he was able to pass the Ease of Doing Business Law, which is another very important law, which amends the uh, anti red Tape Act of uh, a few years back. And hopefully, this Ease of Doing Business Law will be able to cut a number of the processes that we currently have in the Philippines when it comes to uh, dealing with government. So if you look at the past four or five years and look at all of these laws, what we've really been trying to create 
is an ecosystem of support for our MSMEs. It won't only be one reform. It won't only be the Go Negotio Act. It won't only be the Philippine Competition Act. And it won't only be the Financial Literacy Act. It is actually a suite of different reforms that we need to put together, create, and be able to deliver to our MSMEs, to our countrymen, that can really push, push things forward. What we've decided early on was that it's not just one reform, it's an ecosystem. And as they say that it takes a village to raise a child, it takes an ecosystem of good legislation, good policies and programs to support our MSMEs and put them on a path to prosperity. We hope to support our entrepreneurs uh, so that they may succeed in business, provide for their families, generate employment. And as the Deputy Governor had said, the majority of businesses in the Philippines are in this level. 92% micro, 99% micro, small and medium. It makes the best sense to support this sector, which also provides, by the way, more than 60% of jobs in the Philippines. Support this sector, grow them, and make sure that there's a path to prosperity for our MSMEs. A number of our micro entrepreneurs find themselves stuck. And that's the problem. A number of small entrepreneurs find themselves stuck. They, they may start to do well, they may actually get the sales, they may actually have their suki or their customers, but they find themselves stuck because they can no longer access capital. Because they need uh, higher forms of uh, management and they can no longer get the training for that. Or maybe uh, they've saturated their barangay or even they've saturated their city but they need a way to get their products and services to larger markets. These different reforms that we've put together, that the DDI mostly is implementing, hopefully will unlock all of these areas where there are obstacles for our MSMEs and create that path to prosperity. Kung po, if I may speak in Tagalog for a bit, kapag meron pong balaki na nakikita yung mga kababayan natin, at hindi na sila makagalaw, hindi na sila makaangat, Itong mga reformong ito, tinatanggal yung mga balakid na yan para tuloy-tuloy po yung kanilang pag-angat. And this is what we've seen, no? We have so many micro-entrepreneurs, very few are able to move up. And you know, yesterday, we were at a microfinance uh, roundtable, no? With different st stakeholders, the Central Bank was also there. And we were talking about maybe even in the future, the near future, segregating the micro space. Because right now, when you talk about micro, you're talking about somebody who lends at 5,000 pesos and someone who lends at 300,000 pesos. And there's a huge gap between an entrepreneur that needs 5,000 pesos capital and needs 300,000 pesos capital. So what we found is that maybe there's even a need to have a subsector within the micro, create uh, better, more targeted programs for the subsectors within that micro space, and ensure that at every level, every step of the way, you have money, market, and mentorship that guides you at the level where you are. And this is something we want to see. And if we're able to put these pieces together, we'll be able to create that ecosystem, that path to prosperity, and ensure that at every single step of the way, our entrepreneurs have the support that they need. In the business world, we know that, I think the statistic is 90% uh, will go under in three years, and that's largely uh, the accepted number. So it is hard, it's not easy to have a business. It's not easy to grow your business. But what I've seen in social enterprise, in my years in social enterprise, is that with the right program, the right intervention, the right policy, the right kind of support, your smallest unit, and at that time it was the Sari Sari story, your smallest unit of business in the Philippines can have that opportunity to grow with the right intervention. So it's not just a matter of passing legislation, it's passing the right legislation for the right sector. And I think this is something all of you understand no, as successful businesses, that when you get to a certain level, you, don't, you cannot survive on a one-size-fits-all policy. You need policies that will fit where you are at your business cycle, at your level of business cycle. And this is something we've been trying to do. Now, we've been able to pass a number of laws. The DTI has been able to really change and refocus their efforts to really go down to the grassroots and support our MSMEs. But the work is far from over. We still have a number of laws which haven't been passed, which I'd like to share with you today. One of these is the Startup Bill. 
And this is another bill we're very, very proud of, the Innovative Startup Act, which already passed in the Senate. We're just waiting for the House of Representatives version. And once we're able to get the House of Representatives version, hopefully within the year, we'll have another law that supports our startups in the Philippines. I don't know if there are any startups here, but we do have a very vibrant startup community in the Philippines. The problem that they're experiencing is that they service the company that services the company, maybe that also services another company that is the more well-known company in a larger market, in a formal market that's worldwide reach. And uh, it's usually that company in the end that captures all the value. We want to be able to support our startups so they can also compete in the market. And it's very interesting because the process that we used to create the startup bill was very different. We had an initial startup bill which was just a tax incentive. But through the years, maybe about a year and a half, we were able to bring this around to different startups and they themselves created the law. And now it includes uh, provisions for visas for foreign investors, a startup visa. It includes support for your co-working spaces. It includes um, a startup fund, uh, which is from government. And this is the stake of government in supporting the startup community. It's now multifaceted and not just a tax incentive. So we're quite happy with this bill and we're hoping that we can get this passed before the end of the year. The next one that will be passed, because this is already done with Senate and Congress. In fact, um, uh, very soon this will be transmitted to Malacanang for signing of the President. And this is the Personal Property Security Act. This is another law that the BSP uh, also really likes. Uh, this is already at the finish line, so I'm expecting this to be signed into law in about a month's time. And this will allow small businesses to use other properties, such as inventory and equipment, as collateral for loans. As all of you know, banks and financial institutions prefer uh, immovable assets like land. But in our country, there is no centralized registry of these movable assets. And the law particularly creates the centralized registry for movable assets and allows our small businesses to use alternative forms of collateral in acquiring their loans from banks and other financial institutions. Uh, using movable uh, collateral is not it's actually allowed in the Philippines, but the, uh, up, the, the uh, usage of this is very low because the banks don't feel secure in using movable collateral because there's no registry. You know? And this law primarily creates a centralized registry and hopefully that uh, system will unlock more movable collateral in the country, what we call alternative forms of collateral. And now you can use your equipment, your inventory, your livestock, your motor vehicles, your receivables, your patents. Uh, you can use all of these other forms of collateral to access capital. Now this actually is not an original idea. This is um, uh, copied from other countries who have had success uh, using a law or, or passing a law such as this. Ghana, for example, passed this law, a similar law in 2008, and it resulted in over 20,000 loans uh, registered in 20 years. The total financing in Ghana at that time was about $800 million. Countries like China, Vietnam, Mexico also passed similar laws in the last 20 years, and they were also able to unlock so much support for their entrepreneurs. China, which is the uh, success story in terms of passing a Personal Property Securities Act unlocked $3.5 trillion worth of loans and capital for their MSME sector. $500 million for Vietnam and $200 billion in Mexico. So we've seen that in other countries, once a better system is created for personal property, using this to access more capital, it does unlock um, a very important piece in the ecosystem. Here in the Philippines, we hope the passage of the Personal Property Security Act can provide a win-win situation for our MSMEs and banks and be another important piece of the ecosystem that can bring our MSMEs closer to prosperity. With more empowered and successful entrepreneurs, uh, our belief is that the wealth that um, uh, we've seen flow into the country can be better distributed. Uh, you look at the growth in the Philippines and it's at par with the rest of Asia. In fact, sometimes we're number one in Asia. But when you go down to our communities, when you go down to our, uh, maybe if you go out of the cities, even just a few kilometers outside of the cities, or even just 
few 500 meters outside of the central business district, you will find that many of our countrymen are still poor. That many of our countrymen, even if our growth is so tremendous, are not feeling it. And one of the ways that we will be able to distribute growth is to support our MSME sector. Because it's been proven that MSME growth is also distributive in nature. And this is something we've been looking at since 2013. How can we unlock the growth, the economic benefit coming to the Philippines? How can we ensure that more Filipinos benefit from this? And one answer to that question is to support your MSMEs. Get them into the formal supply chain. Allow them to transact with formal businesses. Support them so they can grow to a level where they can partake in the formal markets that currently only formal businesses enjoy. If we're able to develop them, get to that level, and again, convince, allow, persuade, or mandate some businesses to open up their supply chains to more of our uh, MSMEs, then we'll be able to share more of the growth across the land. Yun ho yung pinakapakay nito. No? Kapag natulak po natin itong support sa mga maliliit na negosyante, yung, yung kasaganaan na makuha po natin ngayon na para lang po sa iilan, pwede talagang mas may kalat sa buong kapuluan. That's really the goal of all of this MSME support. So if you look at what we've done in the past few years, uh, there's been a conscious effort to unlock all of these obstacles. We're not yet there, to be very honest. Meron pa pong mga kailangan gawin. And as uh, Deputy Governor Gulikulo had said, marami rin threat. The threats of higher prices, the threat of uh, a new tax law, marami ho dyan ang kailangan pang aksyonan at kailangan pang tingnan upang mas matulungan natin yung mga kababayan natin. But our belief is that with this endeavor with this advocacy, with this mission to unlock this value that's there, to help share this value to more Filipinos across our country, across all levels of society, across that whole um, stratification of different businesses in the Philippines, we'll be able to overcome poverty and build that prosperous Philippines uh, that we all want to see. A number of countries in Asia are in a similar situation. Uh, and this is something we found out in the last ASEAN, in the last APEC, for the first time, no? and I've been in the MSME world since 2006, 2007, so it's been some time since I've been working in this space. And it was only in the past two years, or maybe four years since the APEC up to the ASEAN, that we've seen that even other countries have actually made it their main objective to support MSMEs. The APEC had a similar mission, the ASEAN had a similar mission. So we're coming to a point where support for MSMEs is not anymore a fringe advocacy. Uh, Joey Concepcion, of course, and Juan Lopez who started Go Negotiate in 2003, at that time it seemed like a small advocacy. Very few people were talking about it. But now, it's not only the main trust of government, it's also the main trust of multilateral organizations like APEC and the ASEAN. So we've come to a point where identification of MSME support is now largely recognized as a clear, definite, purposeful, meaningful initiative to support inclusive growth in our country and in other countries as well. Kailangan lang po na mas tutupan natin to, mas bigyan ng pansin, and we definitely need more players to really do their share. Because uh, this won't work if formal businesses won't also partake in the mission and the advocacy. Because we need the formal markets to open up their supply chains. We need them to say, well, as long as it doesn't cost more, I would choose to support our micro and small, our local micro and small and medium enterprises that maybe do the easier path, which is just to import. This is a clear way for businesses to support nation building. And this is why we've been pushing for this advocacy for the past five years. It's uh, government has a role to play, our MSMEs have a role to play, our larger businesses have a role to play, even civil society has a role to play in this ecosystem we're trying to create. And if we're able to focus, put our efforts here, uh, I think we'll be able to achieve the inclusive growth that has eluded our country for so long. If we're able to put our focus here, we'll be able to create that stronger foundation for the Philippines and I'm sure other countries in Asia are also looking at the same uh, process. 
supporting your MSMEs creates that stronger economy for all of us. So let me end there. Uh, let me again uh, thank Richard for inviting me. Thank you all for listening. Marami marami salamat po. Magandang araw sa atin lahat. Thank you very much.